Okay, good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for coming to Green Zone Training today. I'm Jennifer Trimmer. I'm coordinator for OU Veteran Student Services on Main Campus. I'm also a member of the Veteran Support Alliance, the, the volunteer faculty and staff group that works projects like this. Um, my office is Veteran Student Services, and we primarily certify enrollment to the VA for our students using GI Bill benefits. However, we do the best we can to help our military students however we can, um, even if it's regarding referring. Um, also here with us is Shad Satterthwaite. Shad, where did you go? He's right over here. He is OU Equal Opportunity Officer and a visiting assistant professor in political science. Shad is an experienced veteran himself, so definitely a, 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 a nice person to have around, for sure. Um, he is a member of the Veteran Support Alliance and the faculty sponsor for the student group, Student Veterans Association. <laughs> also here today, we have Becky Miller. She's right over here. She is with our outreach campus um, with uh, also a Veteran Support Alliance member, and she'll be talking about um, the active duty students that they service with outreach. Uh, we have a student here, a veteran student. Where did Chris Ann go? She's right over here. Um, she's involved in the student group that we have going this semester, and she'll be giving her own perspective as well. We have Shelly Guttery right over here, Director of University of Oklahoma Disability Resource Center, um, also a member of the Veteran Support Alliance, and she's married to a veteran, so she's got experience as well that's an asset. We have a guest with us here today, Bill Brown. He is right over here. He is with the Veterans Outreach Program Specialist for the Department of VA in Oklahoma City, so it's wonderful to have him here to help with Green Zone training today. I'm going to start out with giving you a few stats about our military-affiliated students on OU main campus. Just five years ago, fall 2008 to spring 2009, we tracked approximately 553 students using GI Bill benefits on main campus. And this consisted of veterans, active duty, National Guard, uh, reserve members, and a few dependents probably using the Disability Education Assistance Program. The next year, fall 2009 to spring 2010, it was the first year our newest GI Bill, the post 9-11, came into effect. The overall GI Bill student <laughs> total shot up to 731 that year. Service members had the ability to transfer their benefit to their dependents if they chose, so our dependent population started becoming a part of our growth of the GI Bill use. Now, fast forward, last academic year, Fall 2012 to spring 2013, the total GI Bill population was around 930. We learned also last year how to track self-identified veterans from their OU applications, the ones that answered yes, they were a veteran. We wanted to find out, did we have any veterans on campus that were not using GI Bill benefits but still enrolled in the semester? Last year we found out, yes, there are. We had about 265 self-identified veterans in addition to our GI Bill students. <laughs> that makes the total for last year 1,195 military-affiliated students just on OU main campus. Now think about it in percentage terms. OU main campus population about 24,500. That makes our military-affiliated population, our 1,195 students <laughs> last year, I know it's going to be more this year, to be over 4% of the overall student population just on main campus. It's definitely a growing student population. Shad? Uh, you know, when we talk about what a veteran is, there are a lot of different uh, versions of, of veterans. I see Casey Partridge here. He's a, a veteran, served with me in Afghanistan some years ago, I guess, right, Casey? There might be some others uh, here as well. Uh, and uh, the, the experiences vary. Uh, some some uh, will maybe be deployed. Uh, some might be into some pretty hot spots where they see a lot of things. I'll talk about that. Uh, and some uh, might not be. Uh, there are males, there are females. Well, we'll hear from a, a female student veteran too. And so there, there, there's, it's, it, the, the, the spectrum is, is very, very is varied. Uh, sometimes the, the days, even if, if, if they don't see combat, can be very stressful. Long days, little sleep, uh, a lot of deadlines, a lot of pressure to get things done. And so they go from that world into a, a, a different type of a, a world here. 
Um, some of the things that they've experienced, I'm just going to list some of the things that, that, that you, you might have students that have, have witnessed or experienced some of these kind of things. Uh, Multi-casualty incidents such as uh, IEDs or ambushes. You go through something like that when somebody's trying to, to take your life and the life of your buddies, that, that can be pretty traumatic. Uh, some will be involved in, in, in friendly fire incidents. These are far and few between, but they do happen. And those are pretty hard, where you've got an accident for, for some reason, somebody uh, either injures or, or worse kills uh, a buddy due to uh, a number of different things. And, and that happened actually on, on one of our FOBs. It was, it was an unnecessary thing. They may witness the death uh, or even <laughs> maiming of children and women, uh, civilians, innocent civilians. They see those kind of things. Uh, gruesome scenes of carnage. Uh, handling dead bodies and body parts. That's a pretty tough thing for a young person to uh, deal with. If they've got to pick up their, their buddy that, that it's, it's lifeless, you know, load his, his body onto a vehicle and, and get him back uh, to the base, that, that can be a, a very difficult thing to deal with. And then just seeing certain things. Sometimes there, there are avoidable uh, losses and, and casualties. Uh, when things are avoidable, uh, they, they can feel guilty about that. You know, why, why did that happen? Uh, sometimes they've witnessed a lot of things, uh, death, injury of a close friend or a leader. They saw that happen. Uh, they may have even been themselves in, in, in having to kill an unarmed or defenseless <coughs> enemy. Just different circumstances may, may uh, uh, happen there. Uh, there might be some injuries, near misses, and maybe they've even had to, to kill somebody up close. And that's a, that's a very difficult thing uh, for, for a lot of, of people to deal with. Um, there was a RAND study in, in 2008, maybe just to kind of give us a, a snapshot of maybe some things that we might see there. It surveyed nearly 2,000 service members, and the study found that over 50% reported a friend that was seriously, had a friend who was seriously wounded uh, or killed. Uh, and so if we look at our population here, think of these numbers, over a thousand, and, and you can kind of get a percentage here to see how many would probably fall into the same kind of thing. Forty-five percent saw dead or wounded non-combatants. Uh, that's a, a sizable chunk. Uh, Ten percent reported injuries that required hospitalization. Uh, just less than 20 percent met criteria for PTSD or depression, uh, something they're dealing with now. And then another 20 percent reported having some type of, some type of uh, traumatic uh, brain injury. Um, sometimes uh, when they get back, they, they, they have a, a, a sense of guilt. There's one student here who had a buddy that his. They actually switched places on a convoy. In fact, it's Gabe. He's the, the president of the Student Veterans Association. You know, had they not switched places, he wouldn't be here today because it was his buddy's vehicle that got hit. And this is something he's, he's even dealing with uh, right now. Um, there is a, a quote I want to share with you. Uh, you know, we're, we're proud here this year, and you hear this talked about a lot, that OU's got five uh, big scholars that, that were all together. We're the only university that uh, has that in the country, the, the, the Rhodes, the Marshall, uh, the Mitchell, the Goldwater, uh, and the Truman. Well, our Truman scholar was a combat vet. His name was Kenneth Meter. And let me, just, he, let me just share a quote from Ken. He says, quote, this is coming here, the biggest challenge I face with regards to my PTSD here on campus is anxiety, especially with regards to taking tests. As a medic in the Army, high pressure situations often had very real life and death outcomes. Sometimes the pressure surrounding tests and finals week, which we're coming up with too, uh, can become overwhelming and have caused me to underperform on some final exams. It actually took me some time to figure out what was going on. One of the things that helped me get back on track was the Disability Resources Center. This Shelley will be talking about that. When I went to them, they knew exactly what resources I would need to continue to be an effective student. And he was. It's, 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 a, it's a success story. And I'm grateful for Ken and other students like him that uh, are able to find the help they need, but even more grateful for those of you that might help direct them to certain places and, and uh, some of the things that they might not be aware of on campus. And that's the purpose, another purpose of the Green Zone uh, training here. Some questions not to ask. Um, and, and it's going to depend on, on some of the students. Once you get to know them a little while, they might feel more comfortable. But I'll just, I'll just go down the list. Uh, did you kill anyone? Did you see anyone die? Are you glad you're back? Did you miss your family? Do you have to go back? Do you think we are winning over there? Is it all worth it? 
Well, some of these questions they have to deal with are still dealing with uh, now. Now, as you, as, as you get comfortable with them and they get comfortable, some are, it's no problem. They'll talk a lot about these things, but some of them, it's, it's a challenge for them. And so just, just be mindful and sensitive when you're asking them. Ask them about how they're doing, uh, you know, school-wise. And, and if they open up to you, that's, that's fine. But these are just maybe some topics to, it'd be best to avoid. Okay, well, I'll, I'll end on that. I, I know we're going to have some time at the end for questions, and we have some other great presentations here. So I'm going to be followed by, who would be next? You, Jennifer? Yes. Okay. I'm going to be talking about a little bit how GI Bill works here at OU and what our students are experiencing. There's three things I want you to remember. The number one thing is that our veteran students have big choices to make immediately after being discharged. And even service members ahead of the game with the GI Bill paperwork experience, there are still unavoidable waits with processing GI Bill benefits and the VA's release of payment. So they're already worried about money, usually when they come on board, um, and these are big decisions that they have to make. Some of them have families of their own, they're married, have children. We have those things to consider as well. And then another thing that's very important that uh, some of us may not be aware of is that the GI Bill benefits, there's more than one. Uh, most people misquote themselves and say, are you using the GI Bill benefit? There's many GI Bill benefits. The post 9-11 one is the one we're most familiar with right now, where tuition and fees are paid directly to the bursar office, but there are multiple GI Bill benefits. But all of them, they have 36 months of eligible benefits. Divide 36 by four years, that's nine months a year of classroom attendance to complete an entire degree. And I know personally, it took me five just to complete my undergrad. So four years is a very short amount of time of eligibility to help assist them paying for their degree. So talking about our service members that have families of their own to support and have big choices to make, it's a challenge because we have multiple benefits for them to choose from, for them to figure out which one is best for them. Um, what's important for us to know as green zones is that they do have a choice and they have a choice to choose one of the many benefits. They're supposed to be an education officer while they're still in their military units to advise and inform them, to help them make the decision. I know from students that come into my office, sometimes they do not feel that that informant is actually very available to them while they're serving. So feel free, send them to my office. We cannot by any means tell them you need to choose this benefit or this benefit is best for you. But we could share what other students have used in a similar situation to help them make their decision with which benefit. The big thing to remember is the VA is actually located in Muskogee, Oklahoma, not Buchanan Hall, room 330. Um, we are definitely not the VA. Um, but we do our best to inform our students as, as much as we can and refer them in the right direction. And you'll hear a little bit from um, Bill Brown later. When something is out of my league, he is somebody I'm going to call because he has a lot of referrals, a lot of information, a lot of contacts he can share with our students. Okay, now these unavoidable weights that our students are talking about. Um, something that my office does to help. It takes four to six weeks for our students to actually get benefits nailed down with the VA. Some of them are discharged really close to the beginning of the next semester, and then they're just getting involved with applying for their benefit, and school is starting, and they have to wait another four to six weeks just to get their benefit functioning. That doesn't count the VA paying OU directly or the student directly. So some things my office does. We have a step-by-step -step guide, literally one through seven, of what students need to do to use their benefit on campus. This guide is on our webpage, veterans.ou.edu, or it's available outside of my office. We'll hand them one. Of course, the number one thing on there is getting the benefit nailed down with the VA and being admitted to OU, number one thing. But there are several things on there that while they're waiting for all of these things to happen, they can take care of. They can choose a degree if they're already admitted. They can be advised. They can make sure the courses that they enroll in are approved towards their degree so we don't run out of time with 36 months. There's things that they can do while they're waiting. Another office that has really stepped forward to make some unavoidable waits easier to deal with is the bursar office. 
Um, for our Chapter 33 students, where tuition and fees is paid in part or in full directly to the bursar, as long as the students have turned in their paperwork for the semester and we're aware that we're just waiting for the VA to pay them, the bursar office removes holds on their account or releases their loan money to them so that they have the opportunity to have um, a monthly allowance while they're waiting on the VA. They have money to live on while they're waiting on the VA money to arrive. Uh, for our non-Chapter 33s, the students that tuition and fees are not paid directly to the bursar, as long as they're making their monthly payments on a regular basis, when it comes enrollment time, when everybody's trying to get into the right class, our bursar office will remove the hold as long as they've been making regular payments, even if they still owe money for the semester. So that's just two examples, what my office has done to make some un unavoidable waits easier and what the bursar office has done. Think about your offices, your departments. What is something that you guys can do to make an unavoidable wait from one of our veteran students easier to cope with? What can you do? Um, and then I'm gonna give you a basic things to remember. So basic knowledge of GI Bill benefits I've shared with you. Some things you can do as green zones, number one, Keep a good set of listening ears open. I've shared with you GI Bill benefits. You're going to have more information to go on before this is over with today. Um, you may be approached by a veteran student. Sometimes they just need the ability to talk to somebody and have time to think. You may not have to say a word to them. They just need to know that you're listening while they're making a decision and go on, going on in their head. Um, another big thing, refer, 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 but refer well. Don't just send them out of our offices not knowing the next step or another person to speak with. Um, if you're not sure, by all means, call me. Like I said, if something's out of my league, I'm going to be making contacts with people like Bill Brown um, if it's a strange situation. The third thing, it's kind of on the same line. Be sure that you're adding a personal touch to your service. Don't just send them out the door and say, hey, go, go speak with so-and-so in arts and sciences or, or whoever you're referring them to. Pick up your phone for a second, call the person, see if it's the right referral. See if they have a minute today or if it's better for you, them to come up tomorrow. Just have a personal touch. So listening ears ready, refer well, and then add a personal touch to your service for our veteran students. I'm going to talk about the veteran experience for our students who are not located here. Um, most of our students are located all over the world. Um, we have uh, students in Europe. We have students. We do have students in Oklahoma. We have students in D.C., Hickam, Hawaii. Uh, we have students who are in Afghanistan, in Iraq. At University Outreach, we are an extension of the University of Oklahoma. We cater to the non-traditional students, the adult learners. Um, we have students that are taking courses on a ship out in sea or on a submarine. And that's through the Navy PACE program through the Center for Independent and Distance Learning. Like I said, we, we reach all over the world. We've had students, we pick up the phone, there's a few second pause, and then we hear them. Usually those are our students that are deployed or downrange. And it's, it's such a rewarding experience working at Outreach, being able to give back to our veterans who give so much for our country. So what we do at Outreach, it's just, um, it's very rewarding. Um, one thing that I talk to the staff members down there about is making our veterans feel at ease when they call. Um, they have so many other things to worry about. They have family members. They are deployed. Um, they have other life stressors. The last thing that they need to be concerned about is what's going on back at the university. So if they have an account that needs reconciliation, they don't need to be worried. Set them at ease. Let them know everything's going to be okay, and we'll take care of it. That's what we focus on down there as staff members. For faculty, um, we work with the non-traditional students. So our courses are online, hybrid courses. We have on-site courses over in Europe. We fly professors from main campus over to Europe to teach courses so they get the same experience that our students here get. Those faculty members know that they're dealing with veteran students. They're helping veteran students. So things may come up. We have a faculty member who is teaching an online class. And uh, the student reached out to him and said, I'm going to have some difficulty finishing my course. Um, I've just been shot in the hand, so it's difficult for me to type. 
this faculty member, actually Will Jacobs, who's a registrar and director down at Outreach, um, he made timeline adjustments and said, I will give you some more time, and if we reach that timeline at the end of that and you need more time, just let me know. They really work with the veterans uh, because they understand, and the spouses who take our courses, they understand things come up. So let's talk about the population of uh, our student body. We have about 750 students that we certify for VA benefits. Um, of those seven, excuse me, um, the active service members that we have for all of our programs range about 2,800 students. That's 75% of the advanced program students are military and 25% approximately of our CLS students are military. So we have a large veteran population. So again, we love what we do down at Outreach. Uh, we love serving the veterans, and um, I wanna thank you guys for coming out and being a part of this. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Ann Haynes. I am a graduate student here at OU. I'm studying adult and higher education. My focus is in student affairs. I'm also a United States Marine Corps veteran. I served from 2004 to 2009. I first came to OU in 2009, about a month after getting off of active duty. So I had a very um, quick transition to say the least. Um, you could say there was a little bit of culture shock there coming back um, with the adjustment time. This was also during the time that OU had um, well, OU and um, the VA in general had just started the post 9-11 GI Bill. So I was one of the first um, really to just get the post 9-11 GI Bill. And it was a really great experience, um, but there were a lot of adjustment concerns just with me in general coming back from the military and that adjustment from military to campus culture. So the reacculturation period um, and my own mentor became one of my faculty members who is also a Marine Corps veteran. So as far as the green zone is concerned, looking at what faculty and staff can do is really being there and being that, that, that mentor and that peer-to-peer -peer support. It wasn't about resources for me, it was about the day-to-day -day exchange um, because we didn't have a really big OUSVA at the time. So I really needed that support and just the opportunity to sit and talk and have the exchange um, that I needed as a veteran because we really look at that acculturation and that cultural exchange as far as military and campus culture. They're two very different pictures that we're looking at. Um, as a female veteran, what we know is that we're really kind of the ghost, ghost on the campus. So we don't see a lot of female veterans. We're not really there um, as far as being the loud, outspoken voice a lot of times. Some are, others aren't, and others aren't on, based on campus and the campus culture. Um, so, as far as reaching out and connecting with veterans, um, just be that kind of voice and be that place, that soft, safe space. I know um, some of the other student veterans were really wanting me to make sure that that was something that was brought up as far as being a safe space um, in campus and classroom. Um, as far as my personal experience as a female, um, I've been questioned a lot of times as far as are you really a veteran because I don't have combat experience. There is a difference between being a combat veteran and being a veteran. So um, don't question your student veterans as far as if they're a veteran or not, especially um, not your female veterans. I don't appreciate that. Um, so um, another thing I want to talk about is just environment. Sometimes student veterans like to sit in the back of the classroom and research has shown us that this is another safe space as far as um, trainings or in, in just the classrooms in general. So sitting in the back of the classroom allows a full view as you can see of what's going on. This um, isn't the same for every veteran but a lot of veterans do like to sit in the back of the classroom. Um, so just be aware when you say, can everyone rise and maybe move and fill in some of the front spaces? That might not be um, the best for your veterans. For me, I like to have a full view. Even though I don't have combat experience, it's still relevant um, for a lot of veterans. We like to have a full view. So just be kind of aware of who's in your classroom. Have an awareness. Um, just make, make it more of an inclusive environment. Um, everyone doesn't need to rise and fill in all the spaces. Um, and... Just don't question everybody, and um, 
that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks guys for coming. I know people have said that off and on. I'm gonna try to navigate around the podium because it makes me nervous. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the Disability Resource Center, the services that we provide, what we do, and then specifically how we can help this particular population. Of course, many of you know the Disability Resource Center, we provide resources and services to students, faculty, and staff with disabilities on all of our campuses, all of our satellite clinics, those types of things. But I wanna talk specifically about our student veteran population today and how we can try to help them what the Disability Resource Center does and what each of you can do in your departments and in your classroom to help to refer those to us that might need that help and how it applies uniquely to this population. The definition of a disability has broadened in the last few years. Originally, a disability was fairly, was fairly limited, and the common practice was it applied to mobility impairments, vision impairments, hearing impairments, and it, and it impacted that major life function, seeing, hearing, walking, talking, breathing, those types of things. 2008, that broadened, and the categories broadened to include things like concentration, sleeping, bodily functions, gastrointestinal kinds of things. So with that broadening, it actually broadened the scope of what a disability meant. Still has the same function, but it broadened it quite a bit. So a disability still is a significant physical or mental or cognitive impairment that significantly impacts one or more major life functions. That major life function being a much more broadened category. How this applies most often to our student veteran population is in the area of some of the things with which they struggle. For this conversation today, it's a lot of it is in the area of what we would consider psychiatric or mental disabilities, struggles, cognitive disabilities, and then certainly still we do have issues definitely with mobility, with physical impairments, with visual impairments, hearing impairments, with things that might happen, whether it's combat experience, non-combat experience, things that happen while they're serving. What we know from research with, with this particular with most recent kinds of activities, whether again, combat, not combat, but primarily combat, is that the type of weaponry that's used now is causing much more significant head injury traumas than what we have seen in previous experiences. So because of that, we are seeing many, many more people coming back with, with cognitive difficulties, with learning disabilities, what would be considered learning disabilities, and just difficulties with mood. We certainly know of the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder, which happens, by the way, whether or not you're in combat or not in combat. Post-traumatic stress disorder is defined as a traumatic experience in which that person either perceives or is in a life or death situation. So we have lots of those experiences. We do have issues with military folks coming back with these traumatic, these brain injuries that are happening, lots of concussive injuries, things that are happening that change the way that their brain functions. It changes the way that they think. So then they're coming back into our classroom environments and they're struggling. We know from the information that, that Shad presented a little bit earlier, almost 20% of our veterans returning have diagnoses of post-traumatic stress disorder. My instinct is it's a little bit higher. Now, from what I understand, is there is folks come back from military service, and please, you two over here, since you have most of this experience and other, other veterans, please correct me, but when you come back, you sit in front of a shrink. I'm a psychologist by training, so I can say that. You sit in front of a shrink, and they give you a screening, and you answer these questions, yes or no, yes or no, and these all these questions about PTSD, depression, anxiety. For the most part, when you get back from wherever it is that you've come from, you want to go home. So you answer most of those questions. No, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm good, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm good. My instinct is that 20% or 18.26%, whatever it is, that at that moment are diagnosed with some kind of mental health struggles, those are the people that were saying, yeah, I'm really having a hard time. My instinct is it's a lot higher because there's a whole lot of people that said, no, I wanna go home. I don't want you to send me to a hospital. I don't want you to send me to someone else who's gonna answer, make me answer more questions. I want to go home. My instinct is it's greater. That number is actually higher when people come back. Now, we don't know what that number would actually be or what it would actually be for. So how does that impact us in academics? Well, we have post 9-11. We have lots and lots more folks coming in with the various GI bills, various resources that are allowing them, thankfully, wonderfully, to come to school, to get an education, to complete an education, to come back to school. So they're here. They're here and they're on our campus. And 
sometimes they're struggling. Sometimes they're just, you know, that, that picture. And I wish you could see it. I wish I could make this big screen. If you've never seen the movie, I can't remember what it is, but it's Adam Sandler in a kindergarten class. That's the picture. And that's what they feel like. And so sometimes it's a struggle and it's different. And what sometimes makes it so much harder is that these are folks that their brain is different now than it was before they left. Their thinking is different. Their moods are different. Their emotions are different. The way that they react to the world is different. How Disability Resource Center can help is we can help to equalize that educational opportunity for them. Here's how you can help me to help them. This is my generalized statement, and I say this before every single, at every single presentation. This is my generalized statement, and I say this because I live with a veteran, and I know how he functions, and I've worked with, been around them, and lots of, of military folks in my family. From my experience, people that go into the military go into the military because they want to help people. They want to protect people. That's their mission. They do it because they are the ones that are going to go out there and stand and make sure everybody else is safe. So when they come back, some of the last things they want to do is say, I need help. Things happened to me, and now I need help. They don't really want to do that. And the other thing is, a lot of times they don't want to say, I think that I have a disability. Because a lot of times they're coming back and they're in better shape than a lot of their buddies are. They have intact body parts. They have the ability to function in a way. So they're in better shape than other folks that they came back with, and they don't feel comfortable. They don't, it's, not, it's not in their makeup. It's not in their makeup to ask for help. And for whatever it is, the name of my department is the Disability Resource Center. <laughs> I can't change that. I don't really want to change that. But that makes it hard when people, when folks have to come. All, all folks, not just, not just this population, but I think this population has its own particular struggles because it's contrary to what they do, to who their makeup is. So as you talk to them, talk to them about, they can just come and talk to me. They can just come and talk to me. At least she's my associate director. They can just come talk to us. They don't have to register. It doesn't have to be something that they get set in stone. They can just come talk. That's all they need to do. Um, I'm happy to just talk to them and just tell them what we can do. Tell them how we can help them. In ways that you can see them, is if you notice them in your classrooms, if, if, for, folks, for those of you that are, that are faculty and that are teaching, if you notice that they do homework assignments, their homework assignments are pretty good, they're doing pretty okay on that, but their exams, they never finish them, or they're always the last one finished, or they kind of start to get up when everybody else starts to get up, but you notice that their answers are kind of scattered and there's chunks that they're not really missing or that they're missing and they don't know why they're missing and it, it doesn't really make sense, but their scores on their exams are really different than their scores on other stuff that they're doing. Maybe they're not able to concentrate. We know that some of the issues with these concussive things that happen because of this weaponry they're using, some of the issues with anxiety and PTSD, things happen and they're not actually in that classroom anymore. They're somewhere else, something else is happening. They struggle to concentrate. They struggle to focus. They struggle to pay attention to what's around them because they're able to sit in the back of the classroom and they hear something down the hallway and they have no idea what I'm talking about anymore. They're listening to something that's down here. And so they've missed that five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever of time that they're working on that exam. So if you notice those things and those scores that you're seeing, talk to them about it. If they're in class, that could be what they're missing on the exam, on their homework. They may be missing chunks of information in class because they're just not... They're just not always there. They may be missing class. There may be time. That was, that was my example I used. Thank you for using that. There may be times they walk into class, and the only seat that's open to them is right there. My guess is some of them may tolerate it, but they may not be real attentive that day. Some of them are going to walk out. Some of them won't even come to class that day. Those are things that we can help with. Those are things for you to say, you know, did you know this is a resource over here? It's OK. Go we'll talk to her. I can say that a lot of the referrals, a lot of the folks that come to see me will say, you know, so-and-so came and talked to you and you weren't big and scary and didn't yell and scream at them, so it was okay so that I could come too. That's my referrals is when they say, you could just go talk to them and it's okay. It's from other people that have come in. What I would ask is if you do talk to them and when you talk to those students, whether it's in your class, your department, whatever it is, please do let them know that it's not a one-time thing. It's not they're going to come over and talk to me and it's going to be taken that day. It's all going to be taken care of. I do have a process. I do have to have documentation of what that, whatever that is. 
I do work with them. I know that many of them coming back, the documentation they have is difficult to get. Many of them coming back have worked through the Veterans Administration. If they are veterans when they come back and if they've completed their service time, they are working through the VA. The VA is a fabulous entity. Bad time of year to say it, but it's really slower than our holiday season. And sometimes it's not the most expedient provider for us. It takes a while to get documentation sometimes, and I know that. But it is not something that they're going to come see me and I'm going to be able to give accommodations to them today. Even if they have documentation when they bring it, I have to have time to look at it to see if it's okay, to see if it meets the requirements that I have so that I can give them the accommodation that's appropriate for them, so I can make sure that I'm providing them the help that they need. So it is a process. It does take a little bit of time. So make sure that they do know that. It's very, very frustrating for me and for them when they come over and they expect it's going to happen right then and then I have to tell them I'm really sorry. It's just going to take a little while. The other thing is to let, let us be that resource that gives them that accommodation. It's, it's equally difficult when I have students that come in that say, I had such and such faculty person last semester and I got to use my notes on my exams. Okay not something we can do you know let us let us work with them to make that accommodation so that we can make sure that it's an equal opportunity in all of their classes so that it's equal for all of their classes that they have um, one very quick thing because I think we will see it more and more often um, the Veterans Administration has a great program that I'm just so very passionate about and I'm really excited about they have invested quite a bit of grant funding and I hope it doesn't go anywhere but they've invested quite a bit of funding in um, providing grant money to individual businesses and companies who train service animals, service dogs. And what they are doing is they are, they are training these service dogs specifically to work with veterans with PTSD. So these are, these are dogs that are specifically trained to break what they would call a dissociative cycle, so a trauma response, where they're actually the veteran is triggered to a trauma event that's happened. The animal is actually trained to detect changes in their galvanic skin response and their heart rate and whatever and they can actually do something to stop that cycle so it brings them back to the present. It can stop a panic attack. It will wake them up in the middle of the night, the middle of the night if they're beginning to have a nightmare. These animals are being specifically trained to work with this condition. So my instinct is we will see many, many more of these animals on our campus. It's a, it's a very large, I've seen many of them around in different areas so I would expect then we would by logic we would see them here. So I'm hoping that that's the case and I'm excited to see them here. I think it's a great program and I hope that continues. Um, I think that that is all. Thank you very much for your time and I will turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Good morning everyone. My name is Bill Brown and I work at the Oklahoma City Vet Center. Uh, the first thing I want to do is thank you for inviting me down. Um, I've been looking for an opportunity to get to this campus for a while, and this is exactly the opportunity that I've been looking for. I want to tell you how, I'm, how impressed I've been with the turnout for these workshops. It shows that you're invested. You're invested in the people who are invested in taking care of us all. I want to start the brief out by asking you a quick question. Imagine for a moment Imagine for a moment that your boss, and I'm assuming that we all have one, your boss walks into your office tomorrow morning, and he sits down and he says to you, we got six months to pack everything up. We're moving our operation to Afghanistan. We're going to be there for a year. What would be the impact on your lives if that was to happen to you tomorrow morning? Panic. That happens. Trust me, that happens. I had a battalion commander one time. He walked in and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to Iraq. And everybody in the room except those wise ones who had been around the, the uh, block once or twice stood up and yelled because they were excited until he waited for the uh, applause to die down. And he said, and I'm taking you with me. And everything got quiet. That's about, a, that's an absolutely perfectly normal reaction. Let's spin that scenario out. Let's suppose you go to Afghanistan or Iraq or some other justly celebrated summer resort for a year or so. Um, what happens when you come back? What's your life going to be like when you get back? 
the first thing I'd want to remind you of before you answer that question is you realize, of course, that you are no longer the same person you were when you left. I will conjecture that this would be the plan. Well, I've got a really great plan for my life. So this is what I think I'm going to do. I think I can do a year standing on my head. A year isn't going to break me. So I'm going to go to Afghanistan for a year. I'm going to do my job really, really well for a year. Then I'm going to come back to my life, and I'm going to go right back to where I was when I left, and I'm going to pick up the pieces of the same plan I had when I left, because it was working really good then. And I'm going to use that plan to execute my life's plans and achieve all my goals. And I'll tell you in advance that it's not going to work. It's not going to work because not only are you not the same person that you were when you left, that place you're trying to get back to doesn't exist anymore. While you were gone, while you were gone, your significant others had a whole year's worth of growth, and they're not the same people either. I did 13 months in Afghanistan, and I could look at the tree in my front yard and see that it had grown in that year. A year gets to be a really long time when you're not at home. That year, you're going to spend, you're going to take care of your job. And as a byproduct of doing your job, you're going to develop some habits. Some of them will stand you in good stead when you get home. The discipline it takes to take care of business in a combat zone, it usually is a good thing. If you're disciplined enough to apply it to your personal life, it's probably going to be good for you. But all of the habits that you acquire in a combat zone aren't necessarily good when you get back. I'll give you an example. When I was in Afghanistan, sometimes I had missions that took me outside the wire. It took me off the compound off the base. I had a Humvee that was assigned to me. It was an up-armored Humvee, as a matter of fact, thick glass, all the armor on the sides, the ballistic blankets down on the floor. IEDs are real popular in Afghanistan, they tell me these days. Uh, but I'd tell my driver, bring my Humvee up to me, please. And when he got there, I'd say, sit in the passenger seat. You see, I wanted control of that vehicle. I needed control of that vehicle because I just think I'm a better driver than the driver that they assigned to me. Then I would go out that gate and I would put my Humvee right in the middle of the road. And when I got there, I would drive very, very fast and very, very aggressively. Because you know what? In Afghanistan, that's a survival technique. Does not, however, equate to what I can get away with out on I-35 when I get back. <laughs> See, things have changed. Things have changed over that course of a year. Now, let me tell you something about change. Change induces stress. And it doesn't matter whether it's good change or bad change. Change induces stress. Got a lottery ticket on the dashboard of my car, and if I win that lottery, I will be the proud owner of $262 million. I will have so much money that I could spend the rest of my life lighting my cigars with $20 bills, and I wouldn't even care. But at the same time, I can tell you very exactly what my physiological reaction would be the moment I got the news that I was filthy, stinking rich. My body would begin to move blood from my extremities to my core. There would be an increase in my blood pressure, an increase in my heart rate. There would be, at that moment in time, a massive jolt of adrenaline. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Should sound a lot like the fight or flight reflex. Counterintuitive, isn't it? It doesn't make sense that my body would react with stress to such good news. But here's what's going on. With your head, you can understand whether change is good or bad. With your heart, you can feel whether change is good or bad. Your body doesn't care. When it recognizes change, it's going to stress you. Now, is stress a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on how you manage it. You see, 
you are in control of your life and how you manage your stress will determine whether you are successful or unsuccessful. I can honestly tell you that some of the best college papers I ever wrote in my life, I wrote them on the Thursday night before the Friday morning it was due. <coughs> the flip side of the coin is stress unmanaged can kill you. Let's talk about the VA for a little bit. I want you to understand how the VA is organized because most people think that the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA, is one homogenous organization, and it's not. There are three distinct sub-entities to the Department of Veterans Affairs, and which part you access really is determined by which resource you're trying to pull to yourself. Three parts, and I'll tell you right off the bat, there's one part that nobody wants anything from because it's the National Cemetery Administration. I don't want anything from them right now. But those are the two parts. Veterans Health Administration, think VA hospitals, outpatient clinics, vet centers, all of that's under the Veterans Health Administration. Veterans Benefits Administration, think GI Bill for Education, home loan guarantees, compensation for service-connected illnesses or injuries, all of that non-health, non-cemetery stuff generally is going to fall under the VBA. Why is that important? It's important because asking a VBA guy for a VHA resource is a, probably going to be as useful to you as asking your banker how to fix your carburetor. No, one part of the VA doesn't necessarily talk to other parts of the VA. I wish it were true. But you have to realize there's a lot of sensitive information being handled by the VA, and we owe it to our veterans to protect their information. So some parts of the VA cannot talk to other parts of the VA. Referral was mentioned. I want to talk about that for a minute. We're going to shift gears. I want to talk about referral. You are all at ground zero when it comes to veterans who attend school at OU. You are the people that are going to see them more often than anybody else on the campus except for maybe the dining facilities. They're going to be in your classrooms and you're going to notice some of their behaviors. Some of their behaviors will not necessarily make sense. There are going to be some people who want to sit in the back of the room or sit where they can see the entrances to the doors, um, the, do the entrances to the room, the doors, who refuse to sit with their back to a window. All of those, they're combat zone habits. They bought them back. And unfortunately, there is no magic switch in the middle of their chests where they can turn these habits on and off. Now, I'll tell you. Part of the fact that they have those habits is a good thing. That means they were well trained before they went. Maybe that's why they got back in one piece. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that those habits are going to be productive here either. But uh, when we talk about referrals, when you, see, when you see that oddity, ask that person if they need help. And if they need help, let me tell you something. This is a new society in which we live when it comes to veterans. When Vietnam era veterans came back from Vietnam, there wasn't a lot by way of resources for them. The fact that we know so much about PTSD today is due in part to the fact that we knew very little about it post Vietnam. When those guys got back from Vietnam, Vietnam was an immensely unpopular war, but when those guys got off the plane in San Francisco, some of them were blamed for the fact that we had asked them to go fight a war. Well, we've grown as a society, and we don't do that anymore. And the point I'm trying to make is there are resources out there. The problem is a lot of people don't know what those resources are, where they are, and who to talk to to get them. 
and I'm not expecting any of you to know that type of information. What I would hope is that you have in your tool bag a list of people who do. And if you run into that circumstance where you have a student that needs help, get them pointed in the right direction. Give them that op option. Give them the information they need to make a righteous decision. And sometimes, I will tell you in advance, their choice will be not to take advantage of the opportunity that you present to them. I would ask in those circumstances that you keep on doing exactly what you're doing. Refer, 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 because I'm telling you, there are resources out there. And a lot of our vets are not using them. I would be willing to bet you, bet you that there are vets on this campus and there's no way to find out if they are indeed veterans. They're not always going to tell you. Nobody, well, I'm not going to say nobody. Some people want to cut ties completely with that experience. Now, if you see a guy walking around with a Operation Enduring Freedom Afghanistan hat like the one I wear all the time, go up and talk to him and ask him anything you want. Obviously, I've made peace with, with what I did there. I still do strange things. My wife is used to me ducking trash in the street. She uh, knows that when we go out to eat at a restaurant, I'm going to want the seat with my back to the wall. See, you know what? It's not just the veterans that we're talking about here. We're talking about their families, their wives, their children. Because nobody goes to a combat zone and comes back the same person. When you make that referral, don't use World War tech II technology. Don't just drop a bomb and hope that inertia takes it to where you want it to go. We've got smart bombs these days. We can guide that sucker anywhere we want. We will hit the target with amazing accuracy. And what I'm asking, I'm asking for your referrals to be a smart bomb. Get them into, get them into Jennifer's good hands. And if Jennifer doesn't know where to find help, there are people out there, and she has a list of them, and we will expand that list for her of people who can provide the services that those people those veterans need and have earned. Let me tell you something. My new employer, the Department of Veterans Affairs, they don't give anything away for free. I take that back. Anything on that table that catches your eye, it's all free. Take it with you. Leave me only the tablecloth. But beyond that, I'm telling you, nothing's free. But those folks have earned it. They have earn the stuff that, we're, that they're getting. If I can be of service to you, please do pick up one of my brochures. On the back side of that brochure, right at the top, in contact information for the Oklahoma City Vet Center. Call me or give this number to your student vet. Tell them to call me. I'm really good at finding resources. The nature of my job is to link veterans up with resources. It's not the base mission of our vet center. Our base mission is to provide combat veterans and their families with the counseling services they will need post-combat tours. To that end, we have a marriage and family counselor. You'd be surprised how many marriages are strained by multiple deployments. Well, I'll tell you, they're strained by the first deployment. I talked to a kid about three days ago. 29 years old, seven tours, Iraq and Afghanistan. Part of that was self-inflicted. He volunteers. Why? Because he can make more money in Iraq to take care of his family and his three kids than he can fixing cars. And I'm not going to mention the car dealer that's out on I-35, but that's where he works. So for some people, they'll go to a war zone because that's how they can take care of their families. But if you do seven tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, Ask that question. That I ask yourself that question that I asked you right at the beginning. If your boss walks in and says, hey, six months, we're going to Afghanistan for a year. Pack everything up. We're going to operate out of 
Kabul. Do that seven times. He's 29 years old. Do that seven times in nine years. And what impact is that going to have on your life? People, if I may be of service to you, please do not hesitate to call me. Here's the blank check that I will call, that I will sign for every single one of you. If you call me because you or your student has need of a resource, there's no phone call I will not make. There's no door I will not knock on to get that resource. And these are the only stipulations. What you want must be legal, moral, and ethical to acquire, because most importantly, I cannot go to jail for helping you find that resource. <laughs> Everything else is on the table. And if you call me, no phone call I will not make. No door I will not knock on. My name is Bill Brown, Oklahoma City Vet Center. Call me if you need me. Please do. I wasn't, I wasn't joking. This may be the only time that you will ever get anything free from the VA. Help yourself. <laughs>